Friends, so today we'll do the current affairs for the fourth of uh, I'm sorry, the fourth of April, two thousand and twenty-two. Okay. Uh, some of the topics that we'll discuss today. Uh, one of the most important topics is that our export has crossed four hundred billion dollars. We have discussed about this earlier also, but currently the full uh, figures for the financial year. Uh, March to April, I'm sorry, April to March, uh, 2021-22 have arrived. So we'll discuss this. Then uh, the next topic that we'll discuss is the president has uh, the president Ramnath Kovind. He has visited Turkmenistan for an official state visit. So we'll discuss about India-Central Asian ties, uh, and we'll also discuss the Human Genome Project. Uh, uh, there has been 100% full mapping of the human genome, and this has been released. So we'll discuss this as well. The rest of the topics are pretty static in nature. Okay. First topic that we'll discuss: the president pushes for tapi gas pipeline in Turkmenistan. Now, please see this infograph. We have been on the tapi pipeline, or India has been trying to implement the tapi pipeline for a very long time right now. The tapi pipeline is being funded by the Asian Development Bank and is to be complete, completed by 2020, according to this infograph, which was when Sushma Swaraj was the External Affairs Minister. And still, the tapi pipeline has not been done. Why? Because of the instability in Afghanistan and because of the connectivity that uh, we need through Pakistan, there are several uh, impediments to the project. Okay. So now, the pipeline will actually originate in the Galkanish. Gas fields and it is run through Afghanistan and Pakistan to Fasilika in Punjab, ideally. Now, President Ramnath Kovind is on a state visit to Turkmenistan. This is the first ever visit of the President of India to independent Turkmenistan. Now, what were the MOUs that were signed between these uh, two leaders? One is the MOU on financial monitoring service, MOU on cooperation in the fields of disaster management, and one more MOU in the fields of culture and arts. And MOU on cooperation in the youth matters. Please know that India and uh, the Central Asian countries have uh, held a long shared cultural bond, homie, because a lot of the rulers who ruled India came from Central Asia, including uh, Babur and and uh, most of the Mughals. They trace their uh, lineage to Central Asia uh, because Babur and his ancestors were actually chased out of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. And then he came to settle down in the Fargana Valley, and then after that he invaded India. Also, most of Central Asia practices a very uh, flexible form of Islam and not radical Islam, and hence, uh, you know, there's a lot of cultural overlap. Also, some of the other events that happened during the president's visit were that a commemorative uh, postal stamp has been released. India Turkmenistan commemorative postal stamp celebrating 30th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations was released. As you know, Central Asia became independent only after the dissolution of the USSR. Uh, and hence, since the dissolution of the USSR till now, it has been 30 years. Need to increase the bilateral trade and economic cooperation. The leaders noted that the bilateral trade between the two countries, which currently stands at less than 100 billion dollars, is not up to the potential. They noted the role of the India-Turkmenistan Intergovernmental Joint Commission on Trade, Economic, Scientific and Technical Cooperation as a coordinating body for enhancing cooperation in this regard. Uh, also, the Prime Minister, you know, the President right now during his visit, as well as our External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar, time and again, they have spoken about the use of Chabahar port for trade with Turkmenistan, Chabar port which is in Iran. So this would form an important part of the uh, trade with Central Asia, according to our external affairs minister and the president. So there is a need to bring these three countries together, India, Turkmenistan and Iran and to operationalize this India, Chabahar, Turkmenistan route in order to increase India's connectivity with Central Asia. Okay. 
also there were uh, talks related to cooperation in the energy sector cooperation in the energy sector was one of the key areas of discussion the turkmenistan side highlighted the benefits of the tapi gas pipeline and also it agreed to examine india's proposals on ensuring integrity safety and security to the tapi project now we'll discuss more about india turkmenistan ties india uh, turkmenistan shares borders with kazakhstan in the north and uzbekistan in the north and the northeast so if turkmenistan is over here you have uzbekistan over here and you have kazakhstan over here okay and uh, india's connect central asia policy envisages deeper mutual relations with the region and energy linkages as an important component of the policy india has joined askabat agreement which envisages setting up of international transport and transit corridor linking central asia with persian gulf to significantly ramp up trade and investment please know who are the other partners of this ashkabat agreement because even oman is a part of it and so is pakistan along with iran turkmenistan india okay so the goal of the ashkabat agreement is to reduce uh, all the hurdles with respect to customs with respect to cross border trade as much as possible to reduce this customs interference and all of that okay india considers the tapi pipeline as a key pillar in its economic relations with turkmenistan india also provides training for turkmen nationals under the itec itec is one of the programs that is conducted under the ministry of external affairs turkmenistan also supports india's permanent position at the un security council okay and recently during the third meeting of the india central asia dialogue which was held in new delhi in uh, december 2021 uh, a lot of uh, you know things were decided such as uh, such as uh, most of the issues were related to central asia of course it's the india central asia dialogue hence most of the issues were related to central asia and several uh, issues were discussed such as connectivity projects okay and uh, there was discussion on the international north south transport corridor the international north south transport corridor is nothing but uh, it's one of these uh, trade routes which connects india with europe and this international north south trade corridor transport corridor also passes through chabahar also uh, the situation of afghanistan was discussed because as you know that just like how india is affected by the turmoil in afghanistan even central asia is affected by it uh, a lot of these refugees who were fleeing afghanistan were actually entering into central asian countries of tajikistan turkmenistan and all of that okay and other issues such as counter terrorism efforts uh, and also india had promised a line of credit of about 1 billion dollars for infrastructure projects in central asia during the second india central asia dialogue okay so implementation of this line of credit was discussed and also restoration of tourism was discussed central asia receives a lot of tourist uh, tourism from india similarly india also releases uh, receives a lot of medical tourism from central asia okay also there were talks with regards to people to people exchanges and cultural connect during this india central asia uh, you know third uh, ministerial conference also central asia is a big part of the international solar alliance and the coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure and you know that both of these entities are headed by india they are organized by india okay now Turkmenistan also possesses very large reserves of natural gas. To be honest, it is either the third or the fourth. I think it is the fourth largest uh, natural gas uh, reservoir in the entire world. Turkmenistan is also strategically placed in Central Asia, and connectivity through Turkmenistan will pay a lot of dividends to India. However, there are certain issues in the relations, like say, for example, the bilateral trade. It is very underwhelming. India can increase its economic presence in Turkmenistan particularly in the information and technology sectors and also 
this will help us have a proper balance of trade because Turkmenistan can export to India energy like natural gas, crude oil and all of that. And so India also needs to step up its exports to Central Asia in order to have a favorable balance of trade. Also there exists no direct connectivity with Central Asia and that's a big problem. Okay, This is one of the reasons why there is not proper exchanges in terms of people to people exchanges, government to government exchanges and also lack of trade. Okay, now next topic human genome project. Now why is it in the news? This human genome project has you know it was actually envisaged a long time back around in the year 2000. So why is it in the news currently? It is in the news currently because it is for the first time that the entire genome has been mapped. Because when the human genome project was carried out in the year 2000 and all, only about 92% of the mapping was done. So the rest 8% has also been mapped currently. So two decades after most of the human genome was mapped, scientists have now filled in whatever gaps that existed. Earlier about 8% of human DNA was left unsequenced. Okay. So why was this 8% uh, left unsequenced? Okay, we'll read about it right now. The genetic sequence was made available in 2003 from the Human Genome Project. Human Genome Project is an international collaboration containing information from a region of the human genome known as the euchromatin. So from here, whatever gene information was revealed, this was uh, mapped into a genome. Okay, under the human genome project. The 8% that was left out was in the area known as heterochromatin which is a smaller portion of the genome and does not produce any protein. So some of the reasons why this place was left out was because it is not so important as it does not produce any protein and also the other reason being that it is very difficult. It is a smaller portion of the genome. So it is very difficult in order to do mapping of it, genome mapping of it. Okay. Now currently the fully sequenced genome, the one that has been released uh, currently is the result of the efforts of a global collaboration called Tel Telomere to Telomere project. Okay. So this is responsible for mapping out the rest 8% and releasing the full genome telomere to telomere project. Now what is a genome? Okay, over here you can see uh, DNA. This is DNA. It is a double helix structure and over here you can see RNA which is a single helix structure and these are nucleotide base pairs ATGC, ATGC. Okay. And uh, yeah, so what is a genome? A genome refers to all of the genetic material in an organism and the human genome is mostly the same in all people but a very small part of the DNA does vary between one individual and another and hence every DNA tends to be uh, or rather or rather every DNA tends to be different from the other because of a very small modification in the base pairs between different different people. Genome represents the complete hereditary information of an organism encoded in its DNA. Okay. It covers the entire gamut of building, running, maintaining an organism and passing life on to the next generation. So this uh, every organism's genetic code is contained in its DNA. Okay. And this uh, DNA is the basic building blocks of life. You know that you have cells and within cells you have nucleus. Within the nucleus you have chromosomes and on the chromosomes you have nuclear, uh, I mean on the chromosomes you have DNA. So this DNA is nothing but the genetic code. It is the building block of every life that exists on this planet. So genome is nothing but it contains all the information that is needed to build and maintain that organism. Okay, a genome mapping is nothing but a mapping of all the DNA segments of a person. In humans, a, copying of the, a copy of the entire genome contains more than 3 billion DNA base pairs. Okay, so a genome comprises nothing but 
a mapping of the entire gene gene structure or the entire dna dna structure of a person and a genome sequence in a human contains more than 3 billion dna base pairs this dna is nothing but it is a sequence of nucleotides nucleotides as an a d g c like what we said which are nothing but amino acids and proteins okay uh the human genome actually comprises of 23 chromosome pairs with with a total of around 3 billion dna base pairs like what we just said so one genome it comprises of about 23 chromosomes comprises of 23 chromosome pairs with a total of 3 billion dna base pairs so genome contains the entire dna information of an individual now what is the significance of this breakthrough of mapping out the entire genome even the rest 8% it makes easier the study of genetic variations a complete human genome makes it easier to study genetic variations between individuals can be used for reference while studying the genome by constructing a complete human genome scientists can use it for reference while studying the genome of various individuals it will help them understand which variations if any might be responsible for diseases the study provides a more accurate information the t2t consortium used the now complete genome sequence as a reference to discover more than 2 million additional variants in the human genome it complements the standard human reference genome the new t2t reference genome will complement the standard human reference genome known as the genome reference consortium built 38 grch 38 this is the existing human genome but this one was an incomplete uh, genome okay the one that has been produced currently is fully updated so please remember this name grch 38 This is related to the human genome project. Okay, moving on, India's exports cross four hundred billion dollars for the first time. India's goods exports grew forty three point two percent in two thousand and twenty one twenty two to nearly four hundred and eighteen billion dollars, rising over one twenty five billion dollars during the COVID two thousand and twenty twenty one time period. So after COVID. India has actually increased its exports of goods. Earlier it was revealed that the total merchandise imports had crossed 550 billion dollars by February 2022 leading to a trade deficit of 175 billion dollars. So while the exports have crossed 418 billion dollars the imports have also increased and they have crossed around 550 billion dollars resulting in a trade deficit of 175 billion dollars so please read what trade deficit is what current account deficit is so trade deficit is majorly to do with goods export of goods minus import of goods okay and then you have something called the net invisibles now net invisibles comprises of okay you have net invisibles you have trade deficit and you have current account deficit the net invisible comprises of services comprises of gifts transfer payments investments okay all of these things remittances so now trade deficit plus net invisibles that forms a part of current account okay so if it is in the negative it is known as a deficit and if it is in the positive it is known as a surplus okay now a bulk of the merchandise exports growth was attributed to engineering goods 
and agricultural products exports, both of which hit an all-time high in 2021-22. Engineering goods grew to $111 billion, okay, which is huge, of which $16 billion were exported to only United States. Agricultural exports were also at an all-time high and they crossed about $50 billion because year on year India had just been exporting about 38 you know 35 to 38 billion dollars of agricultural goods so to cross 50 billion dollars is a big achievement and it forms a part of doubling the farmers income and there was a sharp growth in rice wheat marine products coffee and dairy products okay now it is to be noted that the wheat exports have grown from 2 lakh tons in 2019-20 to 21 lakh tons last year and about 70 lakh tons in 2021-22 about half of this wheat was exported to Bangladesh itself. Okay. Exports had reached $330 billion in the pre-pandemic fiscal year of 2018-19. Over here we are talking about only export of goods and not services. Okay. When it comes to export of services, India has a positive trade surplus already. India exports about 205 to 210 billion dollars of services. And uh, okay, and uh, India imports about say 120 billion dollars of services. So which means that India still has a positive trade surplus of about 80 billion dollars. Near about, okay. Initiatives to import exports. India has introduced various schemes to improve uh, exports, such as remission of duties or taxes on export products. This was introduced in order to replace the merchandise from merchandise exports from India scheme. Okay, and this provides uh, ITC to Indian companies input tax credit, uh, which means the taxes which are spent on their raw materials or input products. We have also in introduced this uh, scheme called the Special Economic Zones. We have an act known as the Special Economic Zones Act of 2005, where uh, there are several beneficial pro provisions for companies which are located within Special Economic Zones, such as reduced uh, corporate tax, such as lack of any customs duty, all of that. Also, uh, we have the scheme called as the Niryat Bandhu scheme, where the Directorate General of Foreign Trade helps in mentoring budding exporters on the intricacies of foreign trade through counseling, training and outreach programs. Another fire breaks out in the forest area and tiger, Sariska Tiger Reserve. Okay, so see these are, this is a list of all the uh, national parks which are found in India. So this is Rajasthan. Uh, you have the Sariska National Park over here. And you have the Keladev Ghana National Park over here and Rantambur National Park over here. So Sariska National Park, as you can see, it is a part of the Arvali range. Okay. And uh, there has been another fire breakout in this region uh, because of the heavy heat waves, heat wave condition and the presence of dried leaf litter on the forest floor. A fire broke out at the Sariska Tiger Reserve in Rajasthan's Alwar and spread to a 3 square kilometer area. Okay, what is the Sariska Tiger Reserve? It comprises of arid forests and dry deciduous forests and scrub thorn forests and grasslands. It's a part of the Arvali range. And it is rich in mineral resources such as copper. Okay, so some of the threats to Sariska are marble mining, habitat fragmentation, forest fires and poaching. Earlier it was reported that there were no tigers which were left in Sariska and hence there were translocation of tigers to Sariska from Rantambur. So please remember this uh, translocation because this was one of the first successful uh, examples of translocation of tigers. Some of the threats to wildlife are illegal wildlife trade which is uh, banned under sites. Okay. Also habitat destruction, deforestation, invasive species like Lantana camara and the other, you know, plants and fishes uh, such as African uh, sailfin catfish and uh, papaya mealy bug, yeah, several invasive species. Also pollution affects them, 
climate change affects them next what are the nearby national parks and tiger reserves like what we uh, saw keladev gana is very close to it and also the rantampur national park is very close to it please expand and read about these uh, national parks i've given them over there it's very straight forward also some of the other national parks which are found in rajasthan are the mukundara hills national park and very recently there has been the addition of uh, a couple of national parks to rajasthan and tiger reserves to rajasthan okay there was a question on the desert national park in the 2020 21 upsc paper so please go through that uh and also uh i'm trying to remember the name of the latest tiger reserve that has been added to uh that has been added in rajasthan i believe uh, its name is ramgar ramgarh tiger reserve please uh, read the locations of these tiger reserves this ramgarh uh, tiger reserve falls between rantambo tiger reserve and mukundara hills tiger reserve it falls somewhere over here okay ramgarh vishtari i believe next moving on AP seeks more time to develop Amravati as the capital region. The Andhra Pradesh government has submitted in the High Court saying that there is a need to remove the timelines which were uh, given by the court for developing infrastructure in the capital city of Amravati, and uh, they need this timeline to be adjusted by five years so that it will be better for them to actually carry it out because the court has given very unrealistic timelines according to the AP government. The Andhra Pradesh High Court had directed the state government to construct and develop Amravati and the capital region within six months. Okay, the court directed the government and the capital region development authority to discharge their duties enshrined under the APCRDA Act. It directed the state to develop reconstitutional plots belonging to landowners and hand them over to landowners within three months, and to complete the infrastructure works in the region within one month. to hand over the plots within 3 months and to finish off the infrastructure projects and uh, in the region it has given 1 month while the ap government is now asking for at least 5 years extension for proper development in the region now what has the ap government submitted according to the government the process of development entails the revival or restarting of contracts for various works connected with the land pooling scheme which are incomplete and consequently the revival agreements have to be signed with the existing contractors so this will take time okay most of the developmental works were executed primarily on the anticipation of loans from multilateral financial institutions like the asian development bank okay like the world bank but most of them did not fructify and hence in order to get these loans in order to talk to these multilateral institutions it's going to take time it cannot happen overnight also a lot of these infrastructure projects were contingent upon release of grants by the central government besides the government had limited resources and constraints and there were priorities on development and welfare activities so this is the reason why the ap government is asking for an extension and they need 5 years for developing the capital region including the infrastructure of the region for now the government has uh, said in the court that it has begun working on the mp quarters the MP, mla quarters and also the uh, stay of the all india services employees nfc technology for instant payments why is it in the news because google pay has recently launched a new feature in india called as tap to pay for upi the feature makes the use of near field communication technology it will allow nfc enabled android smartphones and upi accounts linked to google pay to carry out transactions just by tapping their phones on any android point of sale terminal across the country till now tap to pay was available only for cards okay you had this nfc feature on the cards on the phones and you can tap the phone on any of these nfc readers see while this is the emitter which is the nfc 
uh, waves which are getting emitted from your phone you have a nfc reader which will read these waves which are emitted out from your phone and this results in a transaction being completed nfc uh, transaction being completed nfc works through radio waves okay please remember this now nfc is nothing but a short range wireless connectivity technology that allows nfc enabled devices to communicate with each other and transfer information quickly and easily with a single touch whether to pay bills exchange business cards download coupons or share a document nfc transmits data through electromagnetic radio fields to enable communication between two devices both devices must contain nfc chips as transactions take place within a very short distance okay so these transactions can be possible only when the distance between these nfc devices is very small okay within the range of meters and centimeters okay otherwise uh, nfc cannot work it is based on short range not long range nfc enabled devices must either be physically touching each other or within few centimeters from each other for the data transfer to occur where are the other places where nfc technology is used it has a wide range of applications besides driving just payment services contactless cards and readers use nfc in several applications from securing networks and buildings to monitoring inventory and sales say for example unless and until you have a card of that company you cannot enter into that company's building okay so uh or even preventing auto theft to unlock cars you need say nfc uh, related devices okay and also unmanned toll booths you have seen this concept of fast tag in india so fast tag works on nfc near field communication through radio waves nfc is behind the cards that we wave over card readers in subways and on buses to check tickets if you have traveled by the delhi metro you might have seen that uh you know once you wave the card over an nfc reader only then is the barricade open and then you can enter inside okay it is present in speakers household appliances and other electronic devices that we monitor and control through our smartphones also when it comes to healthcare in order to see what are the patient's parameters nfc enabled wristbands can be used okay uh, to monitor the glucose levels to monitor the urea levels and all of that okay nfc is also used in wireless chargers you might have seen that there is a docking station and then people keep their devices like mobile phones or ipads on it and then charging happens this happens again through nfc technology that is all for the 